Hello YouTube, welcome to the natural Q&A number 10, the Q&A for any questions you might have that have nothing to do with bodybuilding or injuries or nutrition and that could be more personal and I'm always happy to answer. Lots of things to discuss today. Um, if anyone is able and willing to timestamp this, again, I greatly appreciate your efforts. It makes it easier for people to navigate that type of video and to find our questions. Let us start with the few that I selected that were leftovers from the previous Q&A. Some of them I couldn't actually get to because it is starting to become tough to actually select the questions from the comment section. So if your question is not present, ask again and I will eventually answer. Let's get started to the first question, a question that many of you have asked or many of you actually think about because it's truly something that has impacted the channel greatly and that is, why did you stop uploading training footage? It's a good question because this is a fitness channel, it's a training channel and I train all the time. And I used to post training footage all the time. For the OGs of the channel, you remember that at the start of the channel, you would get training footage three to four times a week. It was very frequent. And I stopped entirely. There hasn't been a single training video in something like six, seven months, almost a year. And there is a very clear reason for that. Um, it's actually multifaceted. The first reason why I stopped entirely is because of the reasons I discussed in my TikTok video. For those who have seen it, I told you and I sort of prophesized that those shorts that were starting to, uh, in a sense, infiltrate you to fitness were going to make the platform worse as a whole. And I was correct, meaning that it's gotten to the point where someone like me, who never clicks on shorts, who never actually promotes that type of videos, has shorts recommended to him. And it's not one or two, it's on my front page every single day, meaning that the first six videos recommended to me tend to be at least two to three times uh, on average higher in proportions when it comes to shorts than longer videos. And that shouldn't be the case because these are videos that are supposed to be from my feed, so from channels I'm subscribed to, or videos that are related to what I like. And yet I'm still being recommended stupid, stupid memes and stupid shorts. Why? because it's very popular and because everyone is clicking on them and therefore they replace good quality videos. Every time you see a short on your feed, keep in mind that this is a spot that should have been taken by a video that took time. The issue with all of these shorts is that they are completely worthless in terms of information and they take zero effort and yet they get promoted to a point that is really disgusting to me because it's an idiocracy. It's the exact opposite of what I believe and stand for, which is a meritocracy where you put in the work, you put in the effort, and you get rewarded with visibility. Nowadays, the more idiotic you can make the video, the shorter you can make it, the bigger of a chance you have to actually go viral. And I don't simply don't want to participate in that. I've started to notice that my older videos that are short, even though they are not categorized as short, still get promoted very, very often. And I hate it. I hate to see a video of me doing curves for 30 seconds, get massively boosted, whereas my long videos don't. It's a system that I simply cannot play into. So, on a meta level, I do not want to put out videos that are going to fill and fall into the category of shorts, and that is most training videos. So that's the reason why I stopped posting them entirely. Now, I understand that it's something that you guys liked, which is why I'm trying to bring back training footage in the videos when I make tutorials, for example, I'm going to make more and more motivation videos based on lifting footage that are not shorts. And I'm starting to think about actually posting a full day of training or at least a recap where I take like a month of PRs or a month of notable lifts. I put them all together and I actually share it with you guys because these things are types of formats I wanted to keep in my back pocket because I wanted to actually put them out when I finally enter the bodybuilding competition. I wanted to make it special, but the issue is that I've been in talks with big channels that promised they would actually make online bodybuilding uh, competitions for the community for the past two years now, and none of them actually came through because there's no money for them to make in this endeavor, so they just won't do it. They don't give a fuck about actually promoting natural bodybuilding. So it's something that apparently is not going to happen. There's no point in me just keeping that formula a secret. 
I might have to eventually come out and just share my training just as is because you guys have been very patient and I understand that you are itching for more training footage. That's the first reason. The second reason is more of a personal preference. As you've seen, I'm starting to pivot the channel more towards long formats and more developed and more sophisticated videos, meaning that I always want to be able to be proud of the video I put out. I want to be able to tell myself, okay, this is truly something that took effort and I, I'm proud of the result. Even if the video doesn't do well, I don't care. I've done my best. The issue is that training footage is not that. Training footage is record, do a set of deadlift, post. There's no work. And honestly, when I see these types of videos do better than the videos that I actually put hours in, it's not that it doesn't feel good. I understand that you have your preferences, but it's also something that to me, I shouldn't be encouraging because beyond the motivation aspect, there's not much for you to gain in training videos. And I've also found that there is some danger in them because many people live through that type of videos, meaning that they actually satisfy their hitch for training through looking at someone else train. And that's not good. And if you're like this, I really encourage you to stop watching these videos. This is supposed to be the spark that ignites your efforts, not the fire that comforts you into not doing anything. It's very important to keep that in mind. So that is mostly the reason why I stopped uploading training footage. One, the way, the fact that YouTube recommends these videos a ton now is not something that I want. Because again, keep in mind that if these types of videos get recommended, people are going to subscribe based on these videos and these videos don't represent what I do on the channel. If you're going to subscribe because you saw a set of me deadlifting, what are the chances you're going to vibe with the rest of the content? It's very low. When I see the type of mongoloids that re consume these shorts and these memes and these very small snippets, I don't want them on the channel. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want them to discover the channel through that pathway. So I don't do it. And then it's the personal preference as well. Second question, Pyrenees or Alps? Uh, for me, Pyrenees all the way. The Alps, at least in France, because of course there's the Alps in Italy and Switzerland as well. The Alps is like uh, La Montagne des Riches. It's, it's the rich man's mountain, meaning that if you want to go ski in the Alps, you have to have a lot of money. Skiing by itself is also a, a pastime that is reserved for people who have wealth, which I never had. I went skiing once in my life. It was cool, I'm not going to lie, but I don't really vibe with that mountain at all. Also, it's too pure. It's too pretty. It's all, always covered in snow, at least in France. And it's, it lacks that, that roughness and that that vibe that I actually appreciate much more in the Pyrenees because the Pyrenees are darker mountains, right? You, when you drive through the Pyrenees, you drive through valleys where you, you are like surrounded by these massive peaks that are covered in dark forests. And there is something very romantic in it. And it's my imagination always projected itself much better towards that type of, of natural representation. Also, there is the, uh, the, the visuals of the Pyrenees. For anyone who's driven from France to Spain and who crossed these mountains, from afar you can see them. You see a massive block of black mountains with like dark clouds on top and there's something almost magical to it. Meaning that when I was a kid, I remember, I remember that crossing the Pyrenees was like crossing into a different wood. It was like symbolizing a, a rite of passage where it was a very difficult ride because it was back in the days when there was no obvious tunnels. So you had to take like overpasses and stuff. It was an entire adventure. And so I've always loved these mountains. Also, it's always gloomy in the Pyrenees because it rains a ton. And it brings also that, as that atmosphere of melancholia that I like so much. And the people who live there also, the Basque, uh, the, the Basque people, also very close to my, my heart. So Alps, all the way. Qual é a tua reação com Portugal? Well, <coughs> it's also related to the Alp question. Eu amo Portugal. Um, we, me and my family, have a very close relationship to that country as well. Because we are connected to them by blood. Many of my family members speak Portuguese. Uh, I can understand Portuguese. I can barely speak it, as you can see. My accent is not the best. But the people in particular are good people. And the history of the country is beautiful as well. The, the history of their, their monarchy, the relationship they have with Christianity, uh, the exploration of the Portuguese people who were the pioneers who discovered America, who settled America, the impact it had on Brazil and South America in general. All of that is... Uh, 
something I deeply respect. And I've also always found that, again, these are very nice people. The food is delicious. Pastel de nata is my favorite dessert of all times. I'm not supposed to have it because it's not good for me, but it's, you put a, you put like 20 freshly baked pastel de nata in front of me. I will eat every single one of them. It is absolutely delicious. And Portugal is also a beautiful country. The countryside is gorgeous. The churches are gorgeous. The sea is gorgeous. So if you're someone who wants to explore Europe and you're looking for a country to actually go to, I recommend Portugal. Have you considered setting up a Discord or something similar for community building and engagement? No. Being uh, The reason being that there is too much of the parasocial in the Discord setups I see YouTubers having, meaning that I see too often that it's not really for community building. It's more in an effort to actually have a direct way to tap into the community for the YouTuber. So the entire structure is built around the YouTuber and that is too close to worship for comfort. I do not like it. Meaning that I have absolutely nothing against you guys creating your own Discord and talking with one another. That would be fine. But the issue is that it's been attempted and not just one time. Several people on the channel tried that and I tried to give visibility to these Discords and they never went anywhere because I wasn't part of it. And if it needs me to be an active participant in the Discord, it truly shows that the goal was never community building in the first place. The goal was to congregate around the YouTuber and that is not good. It's not healthy. So I will not be doing that. Now, if you want to try your hand at it and create one and see how it goes, go ahead and try it. <clears throat> But keep in mind, it failed in the past. So whatever community engagement and discussion we can have, we can have on this channel in the comments, it's actually doing very well for the most part, because as you see, I do answer questions whenever you post them in the comments, but I barely interact with you guys because you don't need me anymore. You interact with one another. And that is the beauty of this community. It's that I'm not the chief. I'm not the leader. I'm the guy who makes the videos. After that, you make with the videos what you wish. And it's something I want to preserve. So no Discord. Also, to be honest with you, I wouldn't have time to engage with you in the Discord. So I might show up one time and then never show up again. And there, therefore, it also loses its purpose. It needs to be something that is driven by you, not by me. What are your thoughts on social media and how it's affecting young people? Well, social media is a very... It's a very prevalent mean of social engineering nowadays, meaning that you can easily manipulate people using social media, and TikTok is the best example of that. Look at the differences between the TikTok algorithm in the US, in Europe, and in China. Look at the type of things it recommends to young people. In China, it's going to recommend things based on science, on philosophy, on discipline, on developing the self. And in the West, it's going to recommend stupid challenges and very short videos that destroy your attention span. It's going to promote very uh, dangerous trends. It's going to promote uh, hypersexualized content. It's going to promote drug use. It keeps on promoting these destructive and toxic uh, mental health groups that make uh, a fest and make a, 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 a celebration of mental illnesses and encourages people to identify as their mental illness. All of that is very nebulous. All of that is very dangerous. So uh, to me, it is poison for the most part. Young people should not have, have, have access to social media. And that also goes to, for YouTube, by the way. If you are young and you're on this channel, I hope, I really hope that you have enough intellect and, and instinct to perceive the type of content that is dangerous to you. But I also know that you don't. Because many people on YouTube who are like below 16 and even below 18 watch videos that actually damage them. Like on a, on a, on a personal level. And it's the reason why all of my videos, by the way, are restricted. I click restricted on every single one of my videos, meaning that they're not supposed to be recommended to children. Children should be doing better things with their lives than looking at YouTube. YouTube should be a place that you visit to learn things when you're young. For the most part, you should be outside, away from screens. I can tell you one thing. When I have children, they will not have access to screens. I know it's going to be tough, but until they are like seven or eight, and even that is young, no screens, books, chess, play outside, socialize with people, play sports, develop the body, that as much as they want, discussions with the parents or with their peers and families, spend time with the community, all of that is number one. Screens, for the most part, are damaging. And I'm someone who grew up without screen for a very long time, or if I had access to a screen, it was to watch a documentary. And I, I mainly read books growing up. And when I see the way it impacted me compared to other people, I am deeply happy 
with the difference. So it's something that I would also encourage people to do. So social media, yeah, mostly damaging. There is some positive to it, but most of the positive I see from social media is, for example, like the ability to socialize with peers, but, but that ability was removed from this modern world by the fact that social media itself separates us more and more. So even the positive is in reality a negative. Young people should stay away from social media at all cost. The questions actually do connect very well with one another. Uh, the next one is, what is your opinion about homeschooling? When you have children, do you do, will you put them on, uh, on the school? Maybe not on the school, maybe in the school, who knows, but I actually do like homeschooling a lot. And I typically would love to be the type of dad that spends a ton of time with his kids and raises his kids, not just be a progenitor, but be a father, be a daddy. If I have children, I want, they, they will not have nurses, they will not have nannies, I will be there for them. I will be reading them bedtime stories, I'm going to teach them every language I know as soon as possible. I'm going to make them develop their, their physical abilities, I'm going to read them books, encourage them to read. I want my kids to start reading before I did. And I think, I'm going to bullshit you here because I have no idea if that's correct or not, but I think I started reading when I was something like four four or five. I don't know if it's early or not. I have no idea. But I, I know that apparently it was early for my age. I don't remember. I want my kids to start reading even earlier than that. Because if you can give all of these keys to your kid and not make it, make it a chore and make it a gift for them and make it fun, they're going to have such an advantage. It's going to be like insane. So homeschooling 100% for it. Up at least until the age of six, seven, I want to homeschool them. I don't want to send them to kindergarten. The only w one thing I would have to want to actually pay attention to is the so socialization aspect. I will want my kids to connect with other kids so as to not be stunted uh, socially like many kids who are homeschooled are. After that, it's going to be up to them. If they want to go to elementary school, they can be sent on their way. Something that I would love doing is like a half-half. So I send them half a day to elementary school and the rest of the day I teach them. Because I know that it's the best way to have the socialization aspect and also the pure teaching. Because I remember from memory that elementary school, middle school was a big fucking waste of time. I spent most of the time in the classrooms doing nothing. The pace was too fucking slow. It was teaching me stuff I would never use in my life. I didn't care about. And if I can save my kid from doing that, I would. If I can replace an eight hour day with two hours and then they spend six hours in nature or on their crafts doing art, learning languages, connecting with people, playing sports, I will always do that. So I don't know how doable it's going to be because the economical situation of the country makes it so that it's tough to not have the two parents actually work full time. But it's something that I envision. And after that, even if I do put them in school, I'm going to put them in a very good school, one where I'm going to check that the teachers are actually teachers and not ideologues, not people who are going to push their political agenda on my kids or their lifestyles on my kids. What I want is for you to teach the kid, not to actually turn the kid into you. It's something that must be said because I went to very good schools in Paris and even then the teachers had no fucking idea how to separate their personal life with the academical curses that was, that was supposed to convey to the kid. And even at a young age, it pissed me the fuck off. And therefore, I don't want my kids to have to deal with that either. What are your thoughts on the character Erwin Smith from Attack on Titan? He has, on, he has one of the best arcs, in my opinion, and I love his final charge. Yes, he's my favorite character. I know that many people love Eren because of the character development and the latest season, which I will not spoil. Many people love Levi because he's badass, or Mikasa because she has big boobs. Uh, for me, er Erwin is the best example of a balanced character in the show. He's not perfect. His valor is mostly based on selfishness, because at the end of the day, what he wants is to discover the secrets of the world. But when faced with the possibility to finally discover the secrets or make a choice that would potentially save his country, he, she chose to save his country. And there is, there is, of course, absolute bravery in this. He's a very well-written character, actually an example of someone that when I finally cover Attack on Titan, I will be making lengthy videos about because his philosophy is truly inspiring. I'm not going to say more because I don't want to spoil the people who are only uh, catching up to Attack on Titan or who haven't seen it yet. How good were you at boxing and why did you stop? So I've always been shit at sports for the most part, but there are two sports where I was really gifted. The first one is swimming. 
I was a, a genius swimmer. I can say that without blushing, meaning that I was incredibly good from a very young age uh, without having to train or anything. The first time I was in the water was the day where I was almost drowned and I already knew how to swim, meaning that the only reason why I couldn't actually get myself out of the water is because my body type was not... I was a toddler, so my head was too big. I couldn't actually carry it out of the water, but I already knew how to swim. So it was an innate gift. So that's one. And then there's also boxing. I started boxing when I was 16 and I immediately was much better than every other kid in the class. And actually, I was uh, upgraded to the adult class because the kids didn't want to box with me because I would fuck them up. I think it also came from the fact that I just came out of two years of, of pretty hardcore bullying. So I was a fucking pit bull. So I didn't really know how to also gouge my strength. I would go all out all the time. And therefore, it just also wasn't proper in reality. That's not how you're supposed to spar and interact with people. But even with the adults, I had some of the adults complain about me because apparently I punched too hard. And I remember one time, one of the guys who was a semi-pro at the gym came up to me and he was like, in French, he said, mais attends, c'est pas un mulet. And it's like, it's like saying, oh, he doesn't look like much. Like, why are you guys complaining about his punches? And I remember he, he touched my forearm. I don't know why, maybe because to see if my wrist was thick. And then he, he did a spar with me where he completely destroyed me, by the way. But afterwards, he was like, oh, yeah, okay. He, he does punch like a mule. So apparently, I have a pretty strong punch. But uh, just to counterbalance that, I also have very good memories of boxing with the high-level boxers in that gym. And it's an experience, right? If you've never fought before, I actually, I actually highly encourage you to get in the ring with someone who's a pro. Just to understand how much you mean nothing. Like, I remember being in a ring with a guy who was lighter than me, and it felt like I was being charged by a bull. I couldn't escape. I was trying to actually outbox him and, and jab and create some distance and counter. It was impossible. The guy was in my face every single time. And he would like one hook from him was like being hit by a rock. Another instructor at the gym was this very small African man whose head looked like a, a, a Malteser, you know, those chocolate balls. He was very tiny, like a pygmy. But this guy, when he punched you, it felt like someone was tr like launching bricks even through the guard, it felt like someone was hitting you with a hammer. It was incredible. And I remember that this guy, when he punched you, tears would come out your eyes. Not from pain, just from shock. Because it was like, what the fuck are you throwing at me? Yeah, like, you wanted to take out his gloves to see if there wasn't, like, metal or something in there. No, he was just that strong. And it was a great experience. I loved boxing. But the issue is that I was doing too much at the time. I was doing bodybuilding. I was doing basketball at a decently high level. And I was doing boxing. And I had to make a choice. And what precipitated me towards basketball, because I, I selected basketball instead, was that I got an eye exam and uh, the woman who looked at my cornea told me that I was one of the people who had a very high risk of retina detachment because of my uh, nearsightedness. Apparently, like 30% of people who have nearsightedness have a strong chance of detaching, detaching their retina and boxing is one of the worst sports for that. So I actually went for health, which is something that I do regret still to this day because... The coach, the main coach at the boxing gym had very high uh, plans for me, in a sense. He, he truly believed I had potential, and I do believe that as well to this day. He wanted me to go pro, which is also, again, pro, meaning that when you get pro, it's just that you have a boxing license and you start fighting. It doesn't mean that you're the world champion. I don't know if I would have actually gone through with it, but I would have loved to see how far I could go with boxing. I never actually took it very seriously. And I'm at the point now where I love bodybuilding so much that I don't see myself investing myself in, in, uh, in boxing. Maybe when I'm older, we'll see. But that's the story of, uh, of boxing and why I stopped. Thoughts on homophobia in the Bible and in the Quran and how being gay is non-reproductive and how it is looked down upon and why are people gay? Wow. So two, three very controversial questions. Well, first off, thoughts on homophobia in the Bible and the Quran. I think it's important to look at the time period when judging whether or not other people were homophobic or racist. I see that too many times nowadays. Well, people are going to point out at a book of like of literature like, of the 1600s and say, oh, it's it's problematic because it's racist. Well, yeah, no, duh, it's racist. It's It was 400 years ago. What were you expecting? People to be all accepting and tolerant like you are? It makes absolutely no fucking sense. I hate these people because you know for a fact that they're hypocrites. 
These are the type of people that are only tolerant nowadays because everyone else is. They are only pro-gay because everyone else is pro-gay. You take them and you plug them 300 years ago, they would have been the most racist and homophobic people. Why? They follow the group. They follow the herd. Whatever ideology is trendy right now is what they're going to espouse. They're always siding with the current thing. And therefore, their love and their tolerance is bogus. I don't buy it for a second. I dislike these types more than the hardcore racists and homophobes because at least the people who are just outright hating people are honest with themselves. These types are not. So that's the first thing I want to say. Yes, there is homophobia in the Bible and the Quran. It needs not be hidden. I see too many Muslims and Christians try to sugarcoat it. No, no, no. Your text is homophobic, but it's homophobic for a reason. It's because back then it was just the flavor of the town. It was the way things were going. That's it. We have evolved past that nowadays, but it doesn't mean that the people back then were bad people. It's just that they were living in an environment where it was just the way people were thinking. And also, and it's good because you connect that with the second point, the reason why uh, homo uh, um, homosexuality was hated back then is because it was a much more naturalistic way of life. One where reproduction was still at the center of everything. Nowadays, we moved away from it, where you have people who happy gleefully tell you they won't have children, Meaning that they gleefully tell you they will let their bloodline die with them. Back in the days, it wasn't possible. Why? It's because survival was still at the heart of the species. We wanted to reproduce. We wanted to pass on our genes. There was still a necessity for survival. And therefore, if someone was gay, that person was non-reproductive. So they were not an active participant, participant of society. And it was perfectly acceptable to hate them based on that. After that, you have all of the, the legends that connected themselves with homosexuality as well where they were connected to demon kind. The act of sodomy was greatly uh, forbidden because it was seen as something that was actually um, what could be a term upsetting to God or even something that would bring bad juju into the wood. All of these which could just be used as excuses in a sense to explain why it was necessary to cast away dues that did not work and align with the way society was supposed to function. They were out of the norm. Keep in mind again that being abnormal up until recently was a death sentence. You would be ostracized immediately. You were supposed to be just like the rest of the people. Nowadays, we have a, we have a culture of the underdog. We have a rebellious culture where being different is cool. But all of that, again, is brand new. So, it's the reason why also, by the way, many people nowadays, if they bring up homophobic arguments or they're homophobic themselves, will actually use arguments that were valid a thousand years ago where they will use what I call a civili civilizational argument, where they'll tell you that, well, gay people do not participate, they do not make children, therefore they're not a good example, and it is perfectly acceptable to hate them. If you watch me right now and you're homophobic, you do what you want. I personally am not, because I don't buy into this argument. My qualms and problems with uh, homosexuality and, and gay people in general is more of the fact that they align way too much with this modern world, they consume way too much, they fall for every single trap of political correctness that is laid upon their feet. But I also understand why. It's because they come from a place where they were not accepted for so long that they latched onto the first political movements or social movements that finally accepted them with open arms, regardless of how damaging these movements actually are to them and to their future. So that's mostly why... Um, this entire question of homophobia is actually very interesting and something that needs to actually be developed more. And I might actually make a video on homophobia on the channel at some point, maybe even more than one. And then your last question, why are people gay? Good question. Some people would tell you that it's, uh, it's the environment. Some people would tell you it's biological. I am more of a believer in the biology explanation because it makes sense. Recently, and I mean recently, like seven years ago, there was a study coming out showing that during pregnancy, there is at some point a peak of testosterone production. And that peak of testosterone production in the body of the female has a direct impact on the fetus and the development of the brain. And what they found is that if the peak happens, it stimulates a portion of the brain that is responsible for the perception of pheromones. And if it's stimulated, that portion is going to be extremely sensitive to female pheromones. And if it is not stimulated, it's going to remain in its basic state and it's going to only be sensitive to male pheromones. Meaning that if you have a baby boy and there is a peak of testosterone, the boy is going to be straight. 
because it's going to be attracted to women. And if there's no peak of pheromones, it's going to be attracted to males, which is going to make him gay. This, to me, makes sense because it, al it also explains homosexuality in women. If there is a peak of pheromone when the baby is a girl, she's going to also be attracted to females and therefore she's going to be gay. If there is the base stage, she's going to be attracted to males. This is very interesting because it brings back also the idea of attraction as something that is dictated by evolution and nature, not something social. You're not born and you don't discover your sexuality in the environment. It's not culture that teaches you that. A little boy is born attracted to little girls. He's going to discover that attraction and it might take take him a long time like it did for me but it's something that is innate so i'm also a big believer that people are born gay it's not something that you become it's not a it's not a lifestyle choice it's a lifestyle acceptance right you accept that you're gay and you live your life as a gay man or a gay woman which at the end of the day is the best choice you can make because you're gay there is no point in lying to yourself and also breaking the hearts of people that you're going to betray and to betray yourself you become a worse member of society by doing so so that is my belief and that is why I think people are gay. It's just part of nature. Now we could discuss the reason why there seems to be more and more gay people nowadays. I've seen people advance the lemmings explanation saying that it's a way to control the population because gay people don't reproduce. I accept that but the issue is that the lemmings, uh, the lemmings argument doesn't really uh, function because we have found out that what we believe to be the spirit of the race of the lemmings that made them suicide when there was too many members of them, there was too many of them and there was enough, not enough resources, was greatly debunked. It was proven to be false. So it also sort of shuts, it, 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 it shuts out the wings of the argument that also pertains to gay people. So I don't know about that. I don't know why there are more and more gay people. We could also say that some people are gay trenders, meaning that they pretend to be gay because it's apparently cool. We can also point out the fact that there is such a thing as the Victims Olympics, where being gay ranks you pretty high on the pyramid of oppression. Many people like to feel oppressed because it gives a meaning to their life. All of which things that I will eventually discuss on the channel if I find an excuse to do so. <coughs> so these were for the question that I actually collected. Now we can start with the question with people who have a name. Pum, pum, pum. Dostoevsky, for the next natural Q&A, what are your thoughts on the ethicality of euthanasia? You guys with the, with the hardcore questions all the time. You like getting me in trouble. So euthanasia, interesting. I am a proponent in the sense that I would personally want to be euthanized, meaning that I, have a, I struck a deal with my partner and my family they know full well that if I get into a coma, I have two weeks. I have two weeks to wake up. If I don't wake up after two weeks, they are to unplug me. That's it. That's the deal. I do not want to be a vegetable for life. I do not want to be a dependent. I do not want to be a weight on the shoulders of the people that I love the most. I will never accept that. Likewise, if I start going cuckoo in the head, but I'm still present and there was no bad accident, my wife is to shoot me in the face. Now, she will never do it, sadly, but it's what she's supposed to do because I don't want to live a life like this. Uh, it's a mindset that I apply to myself and that I apply to others, but I also understand that everyone has their own um, ability to decide their life. I would be the type of person to think that if you're in a state of paralysis and you can't live, it would be mercy on my part to end your life. I would never actually do it, but I understand that there is now a movement towards allowing that to happen. Now, for the counter-argument, the issue is that we have to question who is going to have that power. Euthanasia on a personal level or a family community level makes sense because it's the people closest to you or it's you yourself. If you are still like conscience, conscience and you want to kill yourself, it's your life. No one should be able to tell you no. That being said, if you give that power to the government, that's a different question altogether because now you give, a, you give what is essentially a super, super structure of domination the power to take the life of people based on what? That is a problem. So, if it starts being like at, a, at a, a, a legal level and you give the power to nurses, for example, to kill their patients, now it becomes a problem. We've seen that with uh, what we call in French les, les, anges, les anges de la mort, death angels. It's nurses who take it upon themselves to just kill their patients because they think they're suffering. Well, I understand where they're coming from, but that's dangerous. Um, there's a story that um, I love to think about when thinking about euthanasia. It's uh, from Eragon, for the people who read the book. 
At some point, it's a story about elves and dragons and warriors. It's a great book. At some point, there is an elf character that is... Uh, her morality is being questioned by other characters. And one of the humans that is in love with her asks something about her. And the other elf is like, okay, let me tell you a story to let you understand what she's like. Because she appears cruel and she is, but not in the way you think. So the guy tells the, 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 the main character, uh, Eragon, he tells him, look, if that woman were to come across an orc stuck in a bush with a broken wing, she would not take care of the orc. She would kill him, even though the orc is in full health. Why? Because she would believe that in the state the orc is in, unable to fly, it is better off dead. And that sums up the character. She's not evil. It's just that her own perception of life and independence is so strict and rigid that when she applies it to others, it's catastrophic. It's the same here. You cannot allow other people to decide if it's okay to euthanize someone else. It needs to be at the personal level, which means that there needs to be something put in place like a chart or an, uh, an argument or an acceptation, whatever, like with your organs. For me, if I die, the local government is, a, is aware that I want to give every single one of my organs. They need to take everything they can as soon as they can. It should be the same with euthanasia. There should be something that says, okay, if I'm in the coma for two weeks, I want to be unplugged, etc. It, it's, so it's a decision you need to take when you're still sound of mind. So that is my thoughts on euthanasia. Then you can talk about the ethics of it, the religious aspect, the fact that many people will tell you, well... You are not to take your life because it's suicide and it's bad. God has decided it's bad. Well, that's very nice and all, but at the end of the day, it's your life. Even if you're a believer, you, if you manage to, to cling on to life by thinking that, that suffering is, a, is a, an actual, uh, what is the term? Um, it's an actual uh, trial by God. Good for you. But if you're not even present, like if you're brain dead, how is that a trial? You're, you cannot even connect with God anymore. So why not just die? And yeah, maybe you're going to go to hell, but at this point, who cares? It's your life. Again, this entire thing to me is, is dangerous because it's, it's promoting and projecting your own moral values on people and forcing them to suffer through something because in the hope of finally accessing a reward through that pain. But again, that mindset is good to have. And I promote it on, I promote it for myself and onto people that pain is something to accept and to embrace. But if it's on, if you do that to people who are not in that type of train of thoughts, it's just torture at this point. So it's something to keep in mind as well. Again, very interesting topic, a topic that we deserve a video. Buff Asta. You said you would eventually make a muscle manga analyst video on most animes and mangas over the course of you posting on this channel. Could you make a list of the series you plan to cover? Well, not most. The ones that I think are the most beneficial for you guys, for me to make videos about. So, for example, something like Naruto that I've read or Bleach, they are very famous, but I will never cover them. Maybe a few like, okay, okay. Maybe a video on Rock Lee, maybe, but for the rest, I won't, for the simple reason that there's not enough material for me to work on. So, for the rest, and for the ones I do plan to cover, <clears throat> for now, we have done Grappler Baki Season 1 and 2. We have done uh, Kengen Ashura. We have done Yu Yu Akusho. We have done Record of Ragnarok, and we have done Berserk. Right, these, are, these were the first five I wanted to cover. All of these five, the Baki videos are on hiatus because the company that owns uh, Grapple Baki has been striking my channel nonstop. I've received a dozen strikes from these fuckers and I'm engaged in legal battle against them. It takes a very long time to take down the strikes and to restore the videos. If you've noticed, my Grapple Baki videos are mostly down. They took down like 15 of them. I've restored two. I can only restore one per month. So it's going to take a long time. I'm not going to give up. Don't worry about that. The channel is not in danger for now. If it is in danger, I'm going to let you know. But that's the reason why there's no backy videos anymore. It's because they get stricken down immediately. Kengen, I still make videos about Kengen. Uh, um, Recall of Ragnarok, I'm f trying to find the right angle. Also, the anime was so shit that it sort of destroyed my, my enthusiasm for making videos about it. Yu Yu Hakusho I'm still going to make because it's one of my favorite shows. And Berserk, for the fan of Berserk, you know that I'm, I'm uh, hard at work. I have finished collecting all of the material I need for the Black Swordsman arc and the Golden Age arc. So you can expect a ton of videos about that. I'm working on videos about Griffith right now. I have about 
Just on these two arcs, you can expect at least 40 videos. But you know me, I spend a lot of time on that because it's Berserk, I have a deep respect for Kentaro Mira, so I don't want to rush myself. Each video takes a long time, so I'll try to put out a Berserk video at least once a month. If I can do two a month, I would be very happy, but it's unlikely. After that, the next show I'm going to cover is Ajime no Ippo. You, can, you will start seeing videos about Ajime no Ippo this summer. I'm actually going very fast with it because it's easy to collect. And then after that, I wanted to do Dragon Ball Z. The issue with Dragon Ball Z is that it's like Grappler Baki now. The videos get stricken down because the company that owns the rights is Toei Animation, and Toei Animation is run by Satan. So what they do is they constantly strike down the creators that make videos about their shows. And even though I love Dragon Ball Z, I also don't want to risk the parenting of the channel and the life of the channel. So until they stop doing that shit, or until I can actually find a loophole, I will not be able to cover Dragon Ball Z. It saddens me greatly, but that's just how it is. So instead, what I wanted to cover was Terraformals. It's a good replacement. I think it's going to be great. And then there's a plethora of shows I want to cover. I don't know the order in which I'm going to cover them, but I'm going to do Prisoner Riku, which is a very underrated, underrated uh, anime and manga. I want to do uh, Full Metal Alchemist. I want to do Inomaru Zumo. I want to do... Good night, Pun Pun. There's a lot of stories I want to cover. I want to do the entirety of the Baki series when I finally can make other videos about Baki, etc. So you'll see. Uh, I, want, I like to keep it a surprise a bit. Peter Pritchard, where and under what circumstances did you meet your partner? In your opinion, what are the best places to meet women for a serious relationship? Uh, you, for example, school, work, church, hobbies, etc. What are the pros and cons to each place? So first thing, I'm not going to share where I met my partner. But when it comes to where to meet your partner, it can really be anywhere. The wood is a big hunting place for men. Any woman that you see in public is fair game. And I firmly believe that. Do not be afraid to approach women. Do it properly and with the manners. And if she says no or go fuck yourself, don't take it the wrong way. Just leave her be. But approach women as, as often as you can. Of course, be sensitive to the situation. If she's carrying her groceries home... Don't do that. But if she's just there walking around, women are not entitled to being left alone, right? As long as you're being proper about it, even if you're the 15th guy in, the, in a row that approaches her, it's none of your problem. It's her problem. So do it. Talk to women as much as possible. And then the environments in which you're going to do it, the park, the zoo, school is the best, uh, the best place. In reality, you're going to be surrounded by young women who are also going to be in that amorous mindset. It's the best place. So your high school years and your college years are the primary years to approach women. The issue is that these are also the years where women are the least interested in serious relationships and there is uh, a vast amount of hookup culture going on. So it's going to be up to you to also be able to select the type of woman that you're going to date. It's fine to go through a selection process. It's fine to date a woman for a few months and decide that she's just not right and just ditch her. That's okay. Just don't approach it with the mindset of using these women. Like, these are not bag of meat with legs and a vagina, okay? Be proper, be respectful. If you expect to find someone you're going to be able to marry and have kids with, you know you're not going to find that in a hole. So don't treat women like sluts or whores because... For the vast majority of the time, the reason why women behave like this nowadays is because of an adaptation that is only really logical when you look at it. They adapt to what men want, just like men adapt to what women want. So in a generation where most men wanted like quick fucks and no serious commitment, women adapted. It's the reason why hookup culture is now also widely embraced by women, even though they hate it deep down. It destroys them. No woman actually likes that. No woman likes to get fucked and then the guy bounces two hours, two hours afterwards. That's, that's a fantasy. That's a twist of the mind. Men like that. We're designed to like that. Women are not like that. I'm going a little bit off topic here. But uh, it's, it's, it's the type of mindset you're going to have to bring into the pursuit of the relationship. You have to be serious from the start. Not to be hyper-committed from the start, but start with like a correct mindset and then build up from there. So, yeah. Mutual friends that you cited here is also very good. Many people that I know that met their girlfriend was through a mutual friend, and that's for a very simple reason. If you meet a girl from a mutual friend, you already have a stamp of, of approval on you because it means that you're not a psychopath. A friend has already 
a friend of the girl has already spent enough time with you to decide that you're worthy of being called a friend and so she's going to have a, her guard down. It's also the reason why it's so tough to approach women when you're a stranger is because their guard is at 100% because you could be a creep and they're right to be at 100%. It's tough to break down from there. But if you meet her and you're a friend of a friend, it might be at 50%. You still have some work to do to prove that you're a normal and a good guy, but you're still, you're still starting with a big advantage. Church and hobbies are the same. Hobbies, it means that you share a center of interest with the woman, which is very important because you're going to spend a lot of time with that girl. If she's boring, it's not going to work out. I've dated girls that bored me to death. It's not nice for you. It's not nice for the girl. Cultural events, all of that is good. But see, all of your examples are social settings, and that's exactly what is needed. You will be incredibly attractive in the eyes of women if you are a social being. I know it's tough, I don't like being social, but you're not going to meet a girl staying home. You need to go outside, women are outside. Women are community oriented. You need to prove your ability to engage with the community if you want the ability to secure a woman. And for the pros and cons to each place, school could be a con because the culture is not the most mature, as I already said. Plus, if you break up, you're going to be around that person all the time. Also, school should technically first and foremost be about education. So if the relationship starts to replace your drive for education, you're doing something wrong. Work because you don't eat while you shit. And if something goes wrong, you're going to be in trouble. Also, if for some reason you break up and the girl has resentment, she can fuck you up <coughs> because HR is a female-centric department and they always side with the woman. So you could potentially lose your job if she just makes up a stupid lie about you. Church, because I don't really know if there is a down, downside to church, actually. You're meeting someone who has the same faith as you. You just have to be very careful because women, uh, especially women in, involved in courts, for the most part tend to not be genuine. Women are followers much more than men. They are conformists, meaning that many women who are in religion are in religion not because they have a true belief in God, but because they do so as to stay in touch with the community and so as to not be ostracized. So if you are truly a man of faith, if you're Muslim, Christian, whatever, make sure that you actually meet a woman who is like that. Or if, or if you don't care and you just want a woman, don't fool yourself. You will always be more connected to God than she is. Hobbies, I don't really see a downside, downside to hobbies, to be honest. Cultural events, likewise, it could just be a problem if uh, something bad happens with the woman and now it starts to spread around the community because it's going to lower your value in the eyes of other women in the community because now their guard is going to be at 120%. Mutual, mutual friends, because again, if something goes wrong with the woman, you might lose friends. And also because it can create competition at the... At, uh, at, um, at the group level, meaning that if there are several men attracted to the same woman and these men are friends, it can shatter relationships. I've seen guys backstab their best fucking friend for poon, just for the ability to get laid. That, of course, is despicable, but it's very common. I'm sure that many of you actually went through that, so be careful. So that's that. <clears throat> Alors, ça c'est plus, okay. Pum, 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 pum. Gregor Hust. Is there a particular way you read books that are intellectually challenging? Do you have any advice on how to better grasp concepts while reading through philosophical literature? One can make the mistake of reading such books just for the sake of reading them. Absolutely. Many people do that actually, sadly, especially with philosophy, where they are, they are told all the time, oh yeah, read philosophy to improve yourself. It's going to make you a better man. It's going to make you more spiritually inclined. So they're like, okay, they grab a book, they read through it, and they're like, okay, I did my homework. But you didn't, because you didn't actually absorb it. And that's the problem. You cannot read philosophy the same way, way you read like a, a book of fiction, for example. The book of fiction is mostly entertainment. It might have ideas and concepts. A book of philosophy is ideas. You're constantly being challenged on your ideas. You're constantly being told to understand things that you didn't understand before you opened the book. And this is why the way I recommend it is, one, you read through the book one time. Just the way you described it, you go through the motion just to familiarize yourself with the style of the author and the broad concepts that the book presents. Then you read again chapter by chapter with a pen. And every time you come up with something, a concept that is interesting or complex or challenging, you underline it or you put brackets and you're going to revisit it. It's the way I prepare for The Educated Barbarian. I 
read, for example, right now I do niche, I read niche, I read the chapter one time with my, my pen, I underline everything that is interesting that I want to present to you guys, then I read it again and I make a draft, I make a synthesis of what I understand. If you can teach to other people about a text or a philosopher, you understand it. And it's something I realized with Nietzsche as well, where after I make the video, or maybe as I make the video for you and I go through my synthesis, everything clicks, everything starts making sense. So it brings me to a higher level of understanding of the author. And that's exactly what you want to do. So take notes. Take notes and write. It's something I learned from one of my favorite teachers. It was a French teacher. He was a genius. I love the guy to death. He was a fucking beast of a man. Also very severe, very stern. I had terrible grades with him, but I respected him because he was very intelligent. And one day he gave me a book by Heidegger called Hotzweg. Le chemin qui ne mène à nulle part. The, the way that leads nowhere. And I couldn't understand the book. I was 16. It was a mindfuck. But what, what struck me is that he took notes. He took a shit ton of notes on the sides. And funnily enough, his notes were almost as incomprehensible as the book. I remember one time after a paragraph that I couldn't understand about, again, taking the way that leads nowhere, he, he drew a boot next to the thing. I was like, okay, is that supposed to help me? I just read the paragraph that I don't understand from this German philosopher and you, you, you put your boot there and I'm supposed to get something from this. I will eventually revisit Heidegger to see if I understand him now that I'm smarter, but it's something I took from him. Take notes. Take notes for yourself to be able to understand better. Zinkia. So first question is about the Discord server. Um, Discord server, so I cannot help you with that. As I already said, I don't want to make a Discord. And then second question, more personal. Do you have any experience and or advice with trying to bring reason to a brother? that's been brainwashed into thinking he's a girl and get him into lifting and other practices that could help him become a real man again. Do you think it's a trend? Will it die down? Is it the fault of a court? More anime? Thanks for all. Man, very inter interesting question. So again, it connects with what I've spoken about with uh, homosexuality. There is a definite biological implication to homosexuality, just like there is a definite biological implication tr to transsexuality. It's at, the, it's, it's at the brain level. To me, it's something in the brain. That being said, it's also cultural in the sense that if there are people who are going to pretend to be bisexual for clout or for whatever social acceptance because it's cool to be gay, there is a very, very high amount of people who do the same thing with the trans movement. Because again, if you look at the pyramid of oppression, trans people are at the top. They are the most oppressed of oppressed because they are a super minority, meaning that there are a lot of trans trenders people who pretend to be trans. And it's something that's been happening for years and years, ever since it started booming on the internet. People who seven years ago were like main figureheads of the trans movement, you look at them now today, you look them up, they reverted. They're back to being normal. Why? They were never transsexuals. They just pretended because it was the, it was the heat of the moment. It was what was bringing them the most clout. They were liars. So it's possible that your brother is in the same boat. Um, I'm going to go, go at it and say it. It's a, a belief I've always had, and maybe you guys can actually uh, vouch for it. I think that there is a large portion, and maybe your brother is like this, of the male population that is, is actually... Uh, well, what is the term again? <sighs> Shit. Transitioning into females, not because they believe they are females, but because they cannot stand being males. Being a male is too hard for them. It's too tough. The, the, the requirements that society put on your shoulders as a male, the duties, the responsibility, the fact that no one cares about your well-being, all of that is too much to handle for them. They don't like it. They want to be cuddled. They want to be comforted. And therefore, they want to turn into the gender that receives all of these benefits and privileges. And that is being a female. So that's the reason why they switch. That's the reason why they turn. It's not that they, they're females. They're just not males. They just don't want to be males. So whatever else they'll take. Your brother might be in the same boat. It's especially prevalent with men that cannot, for the life of them, get a girl. I couldn't tell you the amount of dudes that I saw that transitioned to females, but still like women. So they're lesbians now? I don't buy it for a second. What I think is that they couldn't get girls being a guy, so now they're a girl, and now they get girls. So that's a net positive in their, in their heads. And I'm sure that some people would say, well, it's insane, NH. Why would someone sacrifice so much just to be able to secure like a relationship, you don't know men. 
Men would cut their left balls for a relationship. That's the way we're built. So putting on a wig and putting on makeup and calling yourself Katya, pff, guys would do that, especially men who are mentally ill. I'm not going to go into that too much, but there is a direct connection with transsexuality and mental illness. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is a mental illness itself, but people with previous mental illnesses are much more likely to be drawn into that type of movement. So maybe your brother is like this. And when it comes to uh, die it down, it might die down, but it might also be that your brother is going to be sucked into it with such intensity that he's going to start doing some operations or things that are going to irreparably damage his body, where even if his mind gets cured, he's never going to be able to go back. Now, I want to make it clear that this is for the case of someone who's a transgender. There are people out there who are transsexuals, and the, the ability to transition is the best thing they could do because it's actually putting a spirit into a body that is going to allow the spirit to not suffer so much. But they're, they're a super minority of a super minority. The number is way over brown. That's a very small percent of people. The rest are people like this who are mentally ill. Now, is it the fault of anime? Yeah. As fucked up as it sounds, I see all of these animes with little girls and shit, and I'm like, how, who watches this shit? There's millions of people who watch this shit, and for the most part, they're males. You cannot tell me that guys who are mentally aligned and healthy males would want to spend hours looking at little girls in anime settings. It's so fucking weird. Looking at guys with big biceps and fucking dudes punching each other in the face, yeah, because that's, that's what we vibe with. We want to be like that. But if you watch girls all the time, all of these moe anime or whatever the fuck, what does it say about you? It's like the, the little pony guys in America, the bronies who watch Little Pony. These guys are mentally ill. They have a problem in their brains. You cannot convince me they don't have an issue. It's the same for your brother. Maybe he got, he got brainwashed by that type of anime. It's entirely possible. Now, when it comes to a solution, I understand that you would want to save him because you see that he's not doing well. I don't know if there is a solution, bro. I really don't. I feel sorry for you and for your brother. Maybe he's going to wake up from the nightmare one day. But any amount of, of tough love you're going to give him, it's just going to push him back further. Because keep in mind that for the most part, he most likely transitioned because he hated the discomfort of being a man. So you bring it back upon him and forcing him and pushing and applying your pressure, what, you, what would make you feel better onto him is just pushing him further into the arms of the toxic community he joined. Because keep in mind that, and you pointed it out, he didn't do that by himself. He got talked into doing it by other people who are just as mentally fucked up as he is. So sadly, your efforts are for nothing. I understand that he, he used to be your brother. He's not your brother anymore. You can just pray and hope for him now. Because all of your efforts are just going to push him further into the arms of the octopus, sadly. Keep in mind that, as Nietzsche would say, poison for one is remedy to the other. Whatever, <clears throat> whatever sort of masculine energy you're going to direct towards him that would jolt a normal male interaction will just push him into being more passive and more submissive and more feminine in a sense. Nanomaster. What is the greatest piece of art you have seen? What do you think about the new art that seems to be quite weird and not as beautiful as older art? The greatest piece of art I have seen. That is a very difficult question. What constitutes art? Is a church art? Or are we talking paintings or sculptures? If we're talking paintings of, or sculptures, a lot of paintings touch me on a deep level. I cannot tell you which one I like the best. Uh, when it comes to the type of art I like the best, that is easy, however. It's impressionist art. To me, that's the one that I love the most. It's romantic art. It's, it speaks to my soul. Um, <clears throat> so it's something that is almost disappear nowadays. It's not really in existence. I vibe the most with buildings that were constructed at a time where I wasn't alive. Nowadays, the brutalism only repulses and disgusts me. So I would say not necessarily ancient art in the sense of the Greeks, but arts of the time where Europe was still something worth respecting. Back at the times when we had artists that would, that would resonate internationally and we would be regarded as the center of the world. That is the period that I like the most. So it's very broad, right? It's hundreds and hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of artists. But as you pointed out very rightly, nowadays it's all but disappeared. Now we have this new art, this modern contemporary art that is not art. Because to me, art is a message conveyed by, uh, by, uh, by a painting, by a sculpture. It's something that makes sense. Nowadays, 
the best art is the art that makes the least sense. If I have to sit down for 25 minutes for you to explain to me what the piece means, it's shit art. I should be able to understand. I should look at your painting and have tears in my eyes because I get it. It touches me on a, on a personal level. Modern art is all but garbage. For the most part, it's, a, it's just a way to actually... Uh, what is the term? On, on dit en français uh, le blanchissement d'argent. Laundry? It's like uh, finance, laundry, whatever. If someone remembers in the comments, let me know. But it's a way to, in a sense, uh, take take black market money, take money that is acquired via illegal means, and then put it in something legal so that you actually make it uh, make it credible, make it relevant. So I hate it. I hate it. Um, yeah, and it's also the fact that it's not beautiful, which to me, art should be beautiful. It's the same as bodybuilding. Your physique should be beautiful. If it's not beautiful, you fucked up. And of course, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but you're not going to tell me that if I show a Greek statue to 100 people, they're not going to all agree that it's beautiful. Nowadays, modern art, you have to hypocritically see beauty in it. Like, you have to perceive beauty in its ugliness. Well, that's not fucking beauty. And this detestation of beauty is actually a symptom of this modern age. And it's a symptom that is extremely uh, damaging, and the reason why civilization as a whole is going down the drain. It starts with art, and then it's, it becomes people. We start accepting ugliness in art and then we accept ugliness in people, in their physique. Look at the fat acceptance movement. There is no mistaking it. It is just the natural continuation of the destruction of the natural order because the natural order is always the beautiful. So, again, a good question. Odan. Hearing your love for manga and the fact that you listen to some Japanese music while training, I was wondering if you have an interest in learning the language or do you feel like it would worsen the foreign feeling of Japanese media? Well, first and foremost, Japanese is a very... Uh, it's, a, it's an investment if you want to learn Japanese. And if you're going to learn Japanese, unless you're a dweeb, it's because you want to go work in Japan. I have no interest in that. I want to explore Japan at some point, but I do not want to actually be a part of their society because... One, I do think that uh, Japan has managed to maintain a very high homogeneous society and it's very good for them. So foreigners need to stay far, far away from Japan. The only ones that should go live in Japan are the ones that have a good understanding of the culture, want to preserve it and want to actually integrate with it 100%. So they, want, they wish to become more Japanese than the Japanese. The issue is that I don't have that in me. Meaning that... Uh, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down is a very nice uh, type of ideology, but it doesn't apply to me because I am the nail that sticks, sticks out. I will not allow myself to actually fall into the ranks of people that I don't consider to be of elevated spirit or I consider that their way of life is not aligned with what I want. It doesn't mean that it's worse than me. It's the reason why I don't want to go live there is because I would just be a rebel. I would just be a bother to the natural order of things there. A natural order of things that has its problems, by the way. This conformism across the board is damaging to the psyche of many Japanese people, meaning that it's, an, it's both a, a great boon and a great evil. But one could also question whether or not getting rid of it would be better, because if they end up just being another individualistic society like in the West, is it really an improvement? I don't know. I think that they need to maintain their very social uh, and rigid social structure, but make modifications within it so as to make it more efficient in general and more aligned with, a, with global happiness and productivity for the people who live there. So that's the reason why I am not learning Japanese and I have no interest in doing that. If I learn languages, it's going to be, Japan, uh, it's going to be uh, Spanish and Portuguese first and foremost. And also be better at English because I don't think my English is good enough yet. Gustave, I have periods where I study a lot and things go great at school. I don't find school very hard, but most of the time I struggle to motivate myself into getting school and things that don't interest me done. Any tips on how to fix this? Well, I'm the same. If something doesn't interest me, I don't have any fire to do it, so I don't do it. And for the most part, humans are like this. I don't know what to tell you. You can maybe go through it, like, like muscle your way through school. It's not going to be a fun time, but it's something that I did. Uh, when it comes to uh, alternative ways to motivate yourself, you could also try to look at the problem a different way. Maybe it's your method of studying that is not right. Maybe you need to find a different way. Maybe it's not the subject that don't interest you. It's the way you approach it. Maybe your history teacher, for example, is a shit teacher. 
you might actually love his story, but the way he is being taught to you is making it unpalatable. In which case, start learning, by, start learning by yourself. I discovered after a while that many things that I hated in school I actually liked. It's just that the teacher was poisoning it for me. Example, English. English was unsufferable in school, but the second I started to study it for and by myself, I loved it. So maybe try to switch your perspective. David. Advices on keeping proper posture while writing and studying. I struggle maintaining a neutral position of my neck and spine. Thank you. Imagine you're a puppet and there is a string connected to the tip of your head and it's pulling you up. See, even in this video, I have bad posture. This is bad posture. It's supposed to be like this. Okay. So your chest is going to be projected forward. Your nipples are supposed to like project facing like first here. The shoulders are supposed to be back and down. Your head is supposed to be straight. The neck is supposed to be stacked. Okay. You don't want to be like this. It's supposed to be stacked. And again, puppet. You're being pulled up by a string. So when the string pulls you up, the head is being pulled up and then the rest of the body. Okay. It creates tension throughout the body. That is good posture. Now, if you stay like this for hours, it's not good posture. You need to be able to move around. It's a common misconception. I see too many people actually promote on this platform where they say, oh, there's no such thing as bad posture. Bullshit. This for three hours is bad posture. What you want is, is flexibility. You want to be able to move. You want to move as you work, but for the most part, you want to move within the axis of the puppet. So as straight as possible, looking forward. Now, the issue is that you might be starting looking down when you are, like I was doing here, what you want is it's okay to round the upper back, but you want the lower back to be as neutral as possible. A good way to do that is to take a pillow, stick it behind your back, above your lumbar spine, not above your lumbar spine, above your pelvis, in contact with the lumbar spine, and it's going to force you to stay neutral. So that is a good advice. You never want your back to not be supported. You want the back to actually be able to rest on something because it's going to maintain the position. So that's what I greatly encourage you to do. And if you work on the screen, what I encourage you to do is to have the screen at eye level. Stack books underneath the thing. I don't care. Get a mouse that you can connect via USD, but you don't want to be always like this because the rounding of the neck reinforces the rounding of the, the lower back and it's going to damage your spine over time. Let's see how much time we have left. Okay, so it's very long. I think we're going to stop here, guys. And I'm going to start again with is your VIA's question for next Q&A. I will try to make the next natural Q&A as soon as possible. As you know, I make them as soon as there are enough questions, but sometimes I let it run for too long and I don't have the time. So natural Q&A number 11 will come within the next two months. If you have any questions, you can add them. They're going to be added to the questions for this previous Q&A number nine. This is going to be it for the Q&A number 10. Again, thank you for all your questions. I hope that my answers are going to help you and guide you and give you the answers that you desired. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.